you ever see somebody, you know, when they're in socks and the sock is like two inches in front of their, where their toes are. It's like, it's loose. It's dangling. <laughs> yes. Like to me, I automatically assume that that person's a moron in all areas <laughs> in life. If you can't feel that your sock is dangling, I don't trust you with my pencil. If you are not getting educated about real estate market conditions up to the minute, whether you're in finance, accounting, you're obviously doing this if you're a real estate agent, you're in mortgages, title, whatever, you're doing yourself and your clients a disservice. This is the Knowledge Brokers Podcast. We've got the band back together here. Byron Lazine's in town. Lisa Chinati's here. I'm Tom Tool, And it was interesting. We were prepping for the show, and Byron said, hey, guys, this is what we need to talk about on the pod. So we jumped right on. That's how cued in we are to what's happening in the market. So I want to lead with the big revision from Fannie Mae. So Fannie Mae, uh, Lisa and Byron, previously they were predicting rates – to be about 7% in Q1 of 2024. They've revised that to 6.4. Q2, they went from 6.8 to 6.2. Q3, 6.6 to 6 flat. And Q4, 6.5% to 5.8%. And we're seeing some other people do this as well. Although I'm clear you need to be careful about how optimistic you're going to be about rates, given how the Fed's walked back some of their comments here. Byron, Lisa, what do you think? Lay it on the listeners here. Well, this week is a clear indication of how you need to be careful when you talk to consumers about the rate. If you lead consumers into believing that the middle of the year, we're going to be smack dab between five and six on the interest rate, and then you turn up wrong on that prediction, they're going to have the finger pointing at you. Because if a consumer hears, 5% by the middle of the year, what are they likely to do? They're likely to wait through all the inventory that's coming on the market, all the opportunity that is being presented to the buyers that are active right now. And if they get to that point and the interest rate is near the same, like I'm on the side, Danielle Hale, I'm on her side that we're over the 6.375 for the year. Small sample size, 19 days. We've got a pretty good head start on that prediction. Um, that we, we went up to 6.89 on the mortgage news daily yesterday based off of where the 10 year is going. And I want to be clear, Tom and Lisa, I am absolutely rooting for this Fannie Mae projection. I want rates to come down. It's really, you're not going to see incomes go up 50, 60%. Lance Lambert did a great piece on that. You need incomes to go up like 69%. Um, you need home prices to go down 41%. One of those two things to happen for us to get to pre-pandemic affordability. Steve Harney said pre-pandemic affordability is not realistic affordability because that was all-time low affordability. Uh, but in reality, what can we get to get to a normal rate of affordability? It's the 30-year fix coming down to five, and that's why everybody's rooting for it. I'm behind. I'm on that bandwagon. I think the 5% rate is a floodgate situation, not five, nine, not a five handle. The 5% interest rate is a floodgate situation. I just don't see it this year. Um, I am, I am pleased to see that Fannie Mae has optimism that we're going to continually gradually improve, but that optimism is being pushed back in this week alone by comments of the fed saying, we just don't know the job market's so strong. They're nervous. They're scared that this thing could take back off, this thing meaning inflation. Yeah, I agree. I, I tend to feel, well, I do think, I, I Tom and I disagreed with Danielle Hale. I think that rates will be slightly south, south of 6.3 by the time we finish the year. I don't see 5.8. Um, I think that that's super aggressive. Same thing, would love to see it because I think it would be a welcome, a welcome change for buyers, for agents, for everything. But all the signs point to it's probably going to bounce around in the sixes most of the year. I think what what I will say, I think seven and eight is probably done. I don't know that unless something dramatic changes, I don't think we see either of those again. I agree. I think the bottom's yep. behind us on a lot of measures. Interest rate, meaning the bottom being a high interest rate, um, the bottom of new listings, the bottom of inventory, 
you know, there's still some, you know, we got to get off of the bottom, maybe in the Northeast, we can get, right. Lisa's got some local stats pulled up, but on most of these categories, nationally speaking, the bottom's behind us. Yeah. yeah. And you look, we, we said an over under Byron for a reason. It's meant to be a tough line. So that 6.375, you're supposed to get people on both sides, but that was really intentional when we did that. And, you know, the reason this is, I would say it's a big revision for Fannie Mae is that you look at what they were talking about just a, just a month ago, they were previously at like 7.6% in the first quarter. Then they came down to seven. Now they're at 6.4. So it looks like they're optimistic, but the, it looks like they're also charting this pretty closely. So I do give them credit there. They're not just coming out with these numbers to shock people or misleading people because you're right. I mean, imagine, just think about this. If you're a knowledge broker out there, you tell your clients, Hey, rates are going to be five and a half. Let's wait. And then they're not. You lost that client in most cases, and you've also hurt them financially, which is the bigger issue here. So I think that's a very careful spot you have to be in. I love that point, Byron. And I want to go over another chart that Lance has where he talked about, you're talking about hitting the bottom. And the Northeast is definitely kind of the anomaly here, but he did a really nice job on his Resi Club analytics website. So it's resiclubanalytics.com where he showed the inventory levels compared to pre-pandemic. And we're seeing places in Florida, in Texas, in the Midwest, some of the Western states there above those inventory levels. But the vast majority of the Northeast, Chicago, Cal parts of California, we're well below those numbers. But I do see it coming up. But Lisa, you're feeling it differently. You talked about this before the, the show here, but the data is not quite adding up. So explain that a little bit locally, what's going on in your market. And we'll put this chart up on the pot here as well so everyone can kind of see it. Uh, because it is pretty fascinating when you look at how local real estate has become. But I want to hear Lisa's local take on this. This is really important. Yeah, it's interesting because we were chatting before and I actually hadn't pulled the numbers for year to date yet. And now that we're a few weeks in, it seems like it's kind of relevant to be able to look at it and get a feel for what the start is. We're actually having a solid start to the year here with the company. I think our agents would tell you that they see inventory loosening up. I think one of the things the three of us spoke about this morning was I think the three of us feel like our listings are starting to loosen up, that we're taking more listings and more inventory. And so I was curious when I looked at our local data for um, Massachusetts for, for listings, this time last year, we had 3,312 listings sitting on market. Right now we have 3,086. So we're down just shy of 10% in listing units sitting on market. In terms of listings actually signed, which means what's been entered into MLS as new listings this this year, last year we had 1660 like listed on market between January 1 and now. Um, this year we're at 1510. So again, another kind of delta, not quite as big a difference, but still definitely there. And even closings. Uh, last year, year to date, we had closed 1,255. Year to date, 1104. We know that in 2024, your business operations will be more important than ever. Once I figured this out, my business was able to scale and take off. See, generating leads is one thing, but getting that deal across the finish line while keeping everyone happy is another story. Enter Mosaic, everything you need once a lead becomes a client. Mosaic picks up where CRMs leave off to streamline the client experience and maximize your productivity. It's the operating platform that gives agents and teams everything they need to stay organized and proactive throughout the entire transaction process and beyond. Transaction management, forms, AI-powered collaborative search, client retention capabilities, and advanced analytics for your business. In other words, you can use Mosaic to create a powerful flywheel for your business. It will help you close every deal, boost your profitability, and generate more repeat and referral business. If you need a better way to run your business, Check out the link below and learn how Mosaic can help you today. Yeah, the, the Northeast is an absolute anomaly, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, you know, Atlanta two pods ago, Lance mentioned Hartford, Connecticut being 80% below inventory. And it, it's it's all through it's Connecticut, it's Mass, it's it's Rhode yeah. Island, it's it's all those, it's parts of New York, it's parts of Jersey. It's it's a wild thing to see. But um when we say the bottoms behind us, it's it's a national trend that we're referring to there for sure. And you've got to know how that relates to your market. Um, you know what else is fat? Well, sorry, but I'll just add what's fascinating is also looking at the predictions where I think 
even Danielle Hale had some stuff looking at average sales price and how that was all going to shake out um, across all of our different markets. And I think Massachusetts was predicted to have a, you know, relatively steady kind of average price point. If I look at our average sale price from this time last year, it was 663. And looking at it so far, and it's, like I said, small, small sample size, because we're talking, what, 19 days so far, but we're 778. Think about that. Like, that's bananas. <clears throat> Massachusetts, the, um, the, the LA of the Northeast. Yeah, it's yes. crazy. It's, it's absolutely fascinating looking at the data and the numbers and kind of looking at how it shakes into all the predictions and gosh. Okay. Well, the Massachusetts, Boston numbers specifically are really eye opening for people who have been there 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you know, that have kind of seen that area develop into what it is today. Yeah, I was out last night. I was with uh, one of our agents shadowing some, some showings with a buyer. I've been with this new agent since the beginning of the process. And we were out in East Boston near the airport, which is, you know, I go back five years and it's a totally different place. And we were looking at $1 million condos, two bed, two bath, $1 million <laughs> in East Boston, um, which- What were they, what been, were they five, 10 yeah, years ago? Yeah, that's what I want to know. It, it wouldn't even have pushed half a million. Like- yeah. Wouldn't even have pushed half a million. It's crazy to me. There, there are part of the thing, you know, with what's happened over the last few years um, and, and where the ownership in real estate sits, 50% of real estate's owned by baby boomers, 40% of total inventory doesn't have a mortgage on it. There are just going to be pockets for the foreseeable future of the country that are going to be quote unquote unaffordable or Another way to say it, only affordable to some segment of the population. And that's yeah. just the reality that we're faced with. So, I mean, it, investors should be really focused on the Midwest, because if you look at Indianapolis or some of these other areas that have seen huge growth the last couple of years, they are still well below these average and median price points that we see across the country. And I think uh, of places like Charlotte, North Carolina, which three, four years ago, is it maybe the same position of an Indianapolis, Indiana, if, you know, if you're looking to invest, you might be getting in there at the right time, as opposed to maybe, you know, later in the game in some of these other uh, areas. But going back to the feel part of it, and love to hear from, back from not from all of you guys, from all the knowledge brokers in the comments, from the feel of it, the agents that are doing the right things that are coming into the office and having conversations that are getting people on the phone, um, you're seeing those agents go on listing appointments and sign them, whether they're going live that week or it's going to be a February live listing. There are some, enough leading indicators that aren't in the data yet that tell me there's going to be more listings in almost every market over the next three, you know, 90 days. I, Byron, I, I could not agree with you more. And, and this data exists in organizations like ours because we have enough agents to like see a sample size. And our listing pace right now through the first three weeks of January, let's call it, let's call it is way ahead of where it was this time last year. And you, you talked about the anomaly of the Northeast. Well, we had like really good weather last January. There wasn't any snowstorms, that sort of thing. That, that slows things down for sure. And it, it kind of goes in line with um, BAM did a really great piece about this, where they talked about that over 20 percent of homeowners are considering selling within three years. And there is that human behavior of people wanting to actually make a move. You talk about the agents showing up in the office. I mean, if, if you want listings, your job is to go out and get as many opportunities as possible and identify those people and have conversations with them and then educate them about what's happening in the market, because it's still a very favorable time to sell. The bottom is behind us, but it's not a buyer's market by any stretch. That's not happening anytime soon. So the the people that are actually taking control of their business right now, and to me, January is one of the best months to stack up that, that pipeline because you hear the objection. I don't know if you guys run into this. Hey, we're waiting until the spring. We want to wait until it's nicer out, right? This happens all the time. Well, hey, let's have a planning meeting right now. Let me show you where the market's going. And by the way, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you know when the best time for you to be on the market is? When the neighbors aren't and rates have come down and inventory starting to bubble up and all this data that we talk about here, we've literally covered it all. There's a lot of reasons why sellers may want to move a little quicker than 
waiting till after the Super Bowl, which is one of those dumb things agents say all the time. I am so clear that we're feeling it because Byron and Lisa, how often have we been preaching? Like, let's go after listings. Let's talk to these people. This is something we do internally on a daily basis for maybe six, eight, 12 months. And now we're starting to see the results out. The market is starting to loosen up just a little bit. It's amazing what you can feel when you put that effort in over a sustained period of time. Yeah, without a doubt. It's, um, it, and I, I think a super important point is it's never anything that's going to happen overnight. Am I never. frozen? Oh, no, you're, you're good, Lisa. Frozen. I I agree with you. You must have listened to my 5 a.m. call this morning. It's a brick by brick market. It's an inch by inch. It's not an overnight. You're not going to, if you're waiting for the, you know, Jerome Powell to come into your market with a cape and save you with, you know, one price cut, that's not going to save your business. No. And I, I think it's like looking at it and I can go back to the three of us. It's been easily nine months of it's skill building. It's building the pipeline and then it's, you know, getting some market momentum, but having the market be a momentum without having the skills already built is a dangerous place to be. Well, imagine practicing on a listing appointment. Imagine, mean, let's take the average agent, right? If you were in the top 50% of real estate agents, if you sold 2.7 listings last year, right? Not even three. This is a real number from NAR. And okay, so you, you do all this work to get a listing appointment, <clears throat> but you haven't practiced your listing appointment in months. You don't know what to say. You go in there and wing it. You try to create the perfect CMA instead of focusing on the client's needs and balancing the time frame and doing all the things that the data tells us are the consumer's biggest concerns. You can just Google this stuff. And if you don't practice that all the time, I mean, I, I just, I cannot stress this enough. And then you go up against a, a semi-competent listing agent. And, and we know that over 70% of people hire the first agent they meet with. You're going to get beat up because you're not able to build that connection and build the trust of selling someone's largest asset. And that's really what the listing appointment's about. So I would argue if, if you want more listings, you better be practicing at least once a week in a real life scenario, running through that presentation in your head almost on a daily basis. And then when you do get the appointment, at least you, you, you're, you're consciously competent. You know what you need to say. You can walk through it and you're not trying to wing the whole thing because it, it, when that happens, it never goes well. And I, I, I mean, I, I don't know what, what, what your observations are, Byron and Lisa, but it's, this has got to be a skill that if you want to take listings, you've got to work on the appointment. It's not like meeting a buyer at a house and winning them over with personality. That usually doesn't work. And you have to be willing to set more appointments. The reason why a lot of agents have 2.7 listings sold a year is they're not going on enough appointments. Agents will get one listing and pretend it's a Netflix special. They will think everybody in the world is watching them on this one listing. Oh my God, I've got a listing and everybody's going to notice. My whole life is going to change. My business is going to take off to the next stratosphere. Nobody's tuning in to your one single listing. Do a great job, serve the client, follow through on every promise, go up over and above what you promised. In fact, in the meantime, go get more listing appointments. They're not going to rain down on you because you put one sign in the ground. Like for, you know, Chris Rock or for Dave Chappelle, they're going to get a whole bunch of bookings off of a Netflix special. This is not a Netflix special. This is a listing in small town or big town USA. And almost nobody gives a shit. You know, what I'll add is tying in off of Tom, I, I think one of the super big differentiators, I know we've spoken about it, is 2021, 2022, a lot of I think what agents were doing was living off of the rapport that they built on the buy side to get the listing. Mm -hmm. I think I'm super clear as I've dug in this year in particular, I failed in my organization to teach, to transfer the skill to go in and build rapport cold. At a buyer, when you're working with a buyer, you get a little bit more time to build rapport. And so therefore it's a little bit easier. You're walking through the showing, it's less pressure. Often we know buyers aren't buying the first home that they see. So you're getting in front of them over and over and over before they're ready to actually make a decision either about the agent or about the home. In the listing appointment, curious about your both of your takes, how many minutes do you have to determine whether you can get in rapport and earn that business? Because I have my number, curious what you guys think. Hmm. That's an inch. I never heard that question. I, I, 
I want to think about this here, but uh, so while, while I'm thinking about it, give Byron and I a minute here. I want to I, I want to back up what you're saying, Lisa, that you only have a certain amount of time when you get there. Right. Most agents don't even think about what to do to build rapport before they show up. Right. And, and oh, I know we've all got proven processes. I've got mine. I know what the results are. And I, I've made the same mistake you did. We didn't transfer the skills well enough. Now we're like doing it so in depth. I, I mean, we're seeing a bounce. I think that's why we're feeling differently. But yeah. what I'm clear on is like my part of my proven process that gets a 71% listing sign rate that's proven over a decade selling 90 listings a year for 10 years straight. So pretty good numbers. Sending a personalized video before you go. I, so many agents, I'm not sending the video. Okay, so you're telling me that you see a 71% sign rate, but you're, you're going to say, you know what? I'm too good to send the video. I'm going to do it my way. Agents don't follow proven processes. And that's one of the downfalls when it comes to listings because they're making that mistake. <clears throat> well, to answer Lisa's question, I think it's an interesting one. I'm just, I'm thinking, I haven't about thought it. about it much. So I don't know that this is a real analytical answer, but I'd say I usually know halfway through the sit down portion. There are times when I've gone on that tour and I don't build rapport on the tour. I'm not tall. I'm not. Ryan Sirhan esque. I can't do a great. I can't wave my arms. <laughs> no, none of us are tall, make, by the way. So I think that's make a room tall. look pretty. I can't do a little spin move. I can't do anything like that. I think for um, our thumbnail, we need a gif of Byron in a tutu doing like a pirouette, like for the thumbnail of this a, week's pod. I'm not a home tour kind of guy. I'm a let's sit down at the table. I agree. And if I haven't built report halfway through there, you know it. You know. There's a way to recognize within the first, I would say, five minutes. You can even do this on the tour if you ask the right questions. You know who's going to be the who's going to be in charge. Who's wearing yep. the pants, so to speak, uh, on the you know if it's a couple, who's the decision maker, um, and you want to make the other person obviously feel included and important in that discussion without stepping on the toes of recognizing that this decision maker is in charge. You want to make them feel in charge, the other person feel important. If you're able to get to that comfort level where they do a glance, they look at each other and like, this guy's speaking to us as you, the decision maker, me as um, you know, your supporter, whatever that their roles in the relationship are, that's when you know you can start building on rapport. And that should happen in the first half of that sit down somewhere to me. Yeah, I, I mean, I've won people over during the presentation because you can read a lot by body language, Byron, right? I mean, you can yeah. see like what, what's happening and some people don't pick up on the cues. They're just spitting out a pitch like it. They just got to get through a script or, or, or something. It's, it's, it's very interesting. I, you know, a half hour is probably a good number because then they, they want to, they're, they're testing you, right? This is a job interview and it's not a job interview where someone's got an opening and they're interviewing all candidates. They're like, hey, I need you to protect my equity in my home. How competent are you? Are you able to deliver a predictable result? Like these, can you meet my time frame, which is one of the biggest concerns consumers have? Are you going to protect me against the deal blowing out? And it, 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 I, I would say thirty minutes is the, like your time frame, really, because you'll lose people after thirty minutes. If it's going well, you can keep them there and then go through and get the contract signed. Because if you're signing it at the appointment, it's going to take longer. I, I think you got that initial like five to ten, but then you got a thirty-minute window. What's your number, window. Lisa? So I, it, I think Tom just hit on it. I think you you can lose it in the first 10 minutes. I think you earn it by minute 30. But I think if you don't have an amazing first 10 minutes and walk in with the utmost professionalism, to your point, Tom, pre we call it <clears throat> priming the pump. What are you doing to prime the pump before you get there? We actually have a courier deliver a box with cookies and a handwritten note. Um, so I don't always do the video aspect of it, but we're doing something to make them feel warm and fuzzy. And like it's a true relationship before we walk in the door that it's not 100 percent transactional. Um, but I've seen agents lose it in the first 10 minutes with just the littlest of things with understanding you know, handshakes, taking off shoes, the way that they guide who's leading from the moment that you walk in the door, who's in charge? Is it the seller who's dictating where you're going, what you're doing in the order of the appointment? Or is the agent taking charge and being able to prove that they're a professional and the authority on what they do? Um, I, so I when, think I used to 
No, go ahead. I didn't. I, th I thought you were finished. Go ahead. I, I think there's two points, right? And I think agents have to be super cognizant of both of them: the first ten minutes, and then the within thirty minutes at the presentation. Since April, we have uploaded new and sought-after courses, content, and tactical assets for your business into the BAMX platform. Not articles behind a paywall that only pontificate to you what you should think and do, but education that actually shows you how to do what you need in today's market. Every day, we continue to add more content into BAMX and our private Facebook community, content that works, content that our members have exclusive access to daily. It's why over 1,500 of you and climbing have joined us in BAMX. It's also why tomorrow's price is guaranteed to be higher than today's. That's called inflation. Do not wait any longer. Use code Knowledge Brokers and join the thousands of agents taking their business to the next level today. Code Knowledge Brokers for 10% off. See you in BAMX. Yeah, I used when I was going on a lot of listing appointments during my career, um, we did the same thing. And, and we would we would do tag team approach on a lot of listings, but we do the same thing. Right when a professional introduction, would you prefer me have my keep my shoes on? Would you prefer me take them off? Anytime somebody offers you a drink, you know, as long as it's not something crazy, you know, you accept, you're Take in acceptance it. mode. Um, yeah. You know, I was very aware. A lot of times they want your shoes off. I was very aware of the socks that I was that I was wearing. You know, there, there's yep. nothing. You, you're never in a worse situation. You have a hole in your sock. That, or you got that those happened to my cousin and he lost the listing. Legitimately, he had a hole in his sock and, and they were looking at his feet the entire time. He should lose the listing. Or you Congratulations, have little, Ryan. I like to wear those in, in uh, invisible socks. Like those would not be good things to wear. It looks like you have a uh, a diaper on your foot that's like falling off, like a too small of a diaper. It looks weird. <laughs> you know, like have a good solid color sock. <laughs> yeah, I know we. Want and they both water. match. Yeah, they I know. They match. Yep. This it it gives you an indication. The other thing is like, you ever see somebody, you know, when they're in socks, and. The sock is like two inches in front of their where their toes are. It's like it's loose. It's dangling. <laughs> yes. Like to me, I automatically assume that that person's a moron in all areas <laughs> in life. If you can't feel that your sock is dangling, I don't trust you with my pencil. Like I, I don't want you. I certainly don't want you around my family. Uh, I don't want you in my home. <laughs> like. <coughs> have some self-awareness right and and so i agree you can lose it pretty quickly sometimes yep. though you know and, and don't hold yourself back from going on more listing appointments if you get this experience sometimes you go you get out of the car somebody's waiting for you in the driveway <laughs> and they are automatically like confrontational or they are just it's just a not a match like like you're just bouncing off <clears throat> each other from the start like one bad word like Okay, that's gonna happen. That's part of that twenty nine percent that Dom's talking about, where it's like I just need to go on more to hit my seventy one percent. Yeah. Because um, there's sometimes where it doesn't matter what you do, you're you're not getting a match there. You know you my wanna... other. Uh... Oh, go ahead, go Lisa. Ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was gonna say the other thing where I've seen agents lose it is by not presenting the contract every single time. Um, every time. And even if you know you're not signing it, and it's clear. I tell agents always present it and walk the consumer through it because even if they're not going to sign it, at least you're proving that you're professional, you're walking them through it. And when they do agree to sign, they've already seen it, they understand it and there's no surprises. Um, but that's my Lisa, other big thing. This is Lisa, a great Tom, point. Do you guys, if you don't get it signed and you're going to do, uh, you know, follow me, do you leave them with the contract? Yes. We every, do time. every time. Every yes. time. Every time. Yeah, yep. But it, it, it's my pet peeve when the agent doesn't at least just present all the paperwork and, and go over it. It's the easiest thing that you can do. And just, again, shows that you're a professional, you know what you're doing and that you're not scared. Of if you yourself. never present, if you never leave them with paperwork, if those things never happen, you're certainly guaranteed to never get the listing. You have yeah. to get the paperwork, the, the thing you're trying to accomplish, the contract in their hands at some point. So always do it on meeting one for sure. Yeah. Well, and you know, there's also this mindset now, Hey, I'll send it to you electronically. This is a <gasps> big problem in our industry. Right. And there's two reasons for that. One, you're lazy and you don't want to stay there Two, 
you can't effectively present the contract to the consumer in a way they can understand instead of going through reading it line by line. That's a major lack of preparation because if you're trying to get a contract signed and you can't even explain it, what the fuck are you doing? And I, I cannot stress this enough. Uh, so you got to read through that. You should be able to explain each paragraph in my view. And this is how we train. We have a whole video training on this. Hey, what's this paragraph say in one or two sentences? What's this right. paragraph say in one or two sentences? Yeah. Do you have a way you're going to present the fee? Do you have a way you're going to present the term of the contract? Because we're all in fill in the blank contract states. I'm imagining, I don't know the Connecticut, New Hampshire and Mass Docs. Yeah, everybody is. I'm just, just making sure. Um, I mean, New, New York gets a little wonky, right? And so the point is, if you're just not even, if you're too lazy to even know what the contract says, how's someone going to trust you? Byron, you talked about how you show up. The other thing, and I think this this hits probably both, but especially men, you got to show up groomed properly, right? Like if you're going to have a beard, commit to the beard, Sh be clean shaven, trim your ear hair. And like, I mean, this is all stuff. Like <laughs> make sure you don't have bad breath, right? Like chew a piece of gum on the <laughs> way. Uh, I, like it, it, it sounds silly. You talked about handshake and eye contact. Those are basics. If you Google rapport building, that's what it is. Make sure you smile enough. Do you have anything stuck in your teeth? Like, and you've got to be interview ready. Byron, you talked about this right after the commission lawsuit dropped. There's so many agents I see, they show up to the office, they look like they're going to happy hour afterwards and it's like Saturday afternoon. What if someone calls you and they want you to come over to list their house? You're gonna go home and change? Is that gonna screw up your day? Like- you know what they're gonna say, How, how's Monday work? The person's like, dude, done. I, uh, I had an Instagram DM today from an agent that knows who I am. This was at 7.45, I answered at, I think 8.10, 25 minutes later, trying to hand off a referral. Sorry, found somebody else. Didn't think you were going to answer. I was like, dude, 25 minutes. Yeah, you get a, you have somebody that says to you, I want a listing appointment this afternoon. You got to be ready to perform. It's it's not, I need three days to prepare. They're moving on. Yeah. I mean, th th we could we could talk about this the whole pot. I mean, this, this could be one a whole thing time. on the contract, Tom, and, and not knowledge brokers. This is something, if you're not doing it this way, maybe this will help you consider to do it this way. Always leave them with the hard copy because you can now always follow up with the digital copy. Hey, I know you left, I left you the paper. Uh, I know papers can get shuffled around. Want to also send you the digital copy if, if this is a better way for you to review. You want to get, hey, if I could get them the contract three or four different ways, I'd do it. Paper or, or technology, rather, electronic signing and all that has enabled us to do more follow up, has enabled us to be more of a professional. It doesn't mean you remove leaving them the paperwork when you were face to face with them. Yeah. And, 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 and if you do leave the paperwork and you don't get the contract signed, there's another mistake I see people make. You've got to have clear next steps about what's going to happen next. So, Hey, Byron, I know, I know you and Nicole aren't ready, right? Like you, you want to, you, you got to talk things over. Totally get that. Short of you guys having a conversation, is there anything else holding you back from hiring our team right now? See what the objections are. Let them talk, right? And they say, no, not really. We just need to have a conversation. Awesome. So when would be a good time for me to follow up with you? Why don't we get into the calendar right now? So that way I'm not trying to catch you at a bad time. And then go actually like schedule something literally in the calendar. Send them a calendar invite if you want to get that aggressive. I think all this stuff is, it's super intentional and it's professional. Think about when you get like your haircut. I get a confirmation text every time I get my haircut. But you don't get that from your agent. You don't get a calendar invite. It's just this stuff works. And if you think you're better than this, show me your listing percentage that you're getting signed. And we'll, we'll actually, we, we can go over it together because I guarantee you're not at 71%. Tom, you can come back over for that second meeting as long as you don't wear Shaquille O'Neal's socks when you come on the appointment <laughs> well, next time. The thing is, uh, I have a picture next to Shaq and I look like Herbie the Elf next to him. So don't worry. Oh my gosh, I remember that picture. It's, it's a put good that one. picture, have Haley put that picture on the pod. I, I, will, I will send it. It's, uh, it's a fan favorite. Me and, <laughs> me and Doug, it's, it's, we look like, the abominable snowman from Rudolph and then two Herbie the elves next to him. Like, hey. No, it's Rudolph. Your nose is so red from like. <laughs> from drinking? Or from yeah, the exactly. Well, it's not hot in Dallas. <laughs> it was Dallas, so it, it wasn't the weather. <laughs> I think it get cold in Dallas. All right. We had a bunch. Of, we <laughs> kind of went deep into listings, which was good. I don't know if you want to leave it there, Tom, or. So um, let, let's, let's hit on. I, I think we could leave. I. I kind of like this episode here because this is, we're seeing li episode. listings loosen up and 
you know, I, I get love, love to see in the comments if there's anything tactically like this you want to hear from myself, Byron, or Lisa, because we can talk about this stuff as much as anything else. And all the data that we go over and how we're explaining it, those are conversations that happen at the listing appointment. I mean, how many times do you guys get the question, so what's going to happen in the market in the spring? And you can't explain that stuff. It, it, it's so, so critical because I guarantee you, if they're interviewing three agents, right? One or two of them isn't going to be able to answer that question whatsoever or in a way they can understand. So you got to know the tactical stuff, the market stuff, as well as how to run the presentation pretty intentionally with a predictable result. Absolutely. Agreed. Let's leave it I there, guys. Yeah, I think I think that, that there's too much. I would re listen to this like twice, take some notes and, you know, we, we can we can keep going deeper on listings. That's the game right now. Yeah, the li the listing uh, portion of this pod is super shareable. Share with somebody who's trying to get more listings this year. And uh, hopefully we'll be back with a less volatile week in the 30. Hopefully it'll be under where it is today. Let's hope so. Fingers crossed. See you guys.